MySQL and Postgres are databases that you're used to, but did you know that there's another database that's even more commonplace, SQLite? This is a database that's embedded in your application and it is the most widely used database in the world because it's embedded into applications that you use every day, such as your web browser. Now, guess what? You can take the power of that database as well and embed it into your applications. It is so powerful and so performant that you can target your specific use cases and even distribute the workload across large swaths of users. Taking a quick look here, we see that Kent Dodds is gonna give us some details about how that works and ways that we could leverage SQLite. So we're very much used to MySQL and Postgres. These are fantastic solutions, uh, great solutions, essentially use them all the time and they work great. However, there are very many excellent cases where SQLite can dramatically simplify our application stack. From an operations perspective, SQLite is kind of particularly unique because the entire database is in a single file, right? That's one giant file. And guess what? It turns out just because of the indexing system, it is very much capable of dealing with pretty large data sets and still being performant. Example here, it says, if we scroll down, there's some zero latency impact, specifically because it's embedded directly beside your application. And from an application development perspective, this zero latency kind of eliminates the need to worry about how many uh, queries that you make against that data set. Uh, essentially, that latency jump to and fro between the databases always adds another stack of latency. But if the data is right there at your fingertips, guess what? It will allow you to make a whole bunch of queries at once and still have a pretty good performance. And something that isn't necessarily mentioned here in this document is that SQLite, it tends to be a secret sauce in a lot of these enterprise solutions that tout high performance scalability and low latency memory databases. These systems you can pay a lot of money for and you will get the good performance out of it, mostly because it's all based on SQLite. In the, in the background, this technology is leveraged and resold in a way that you could just get for free off the shelf by installing it into your application directly. One less service to maintain sounds fantastic to me where you have the world of Postgres and MySQL and other databases. These are whole other stacks of systems that you have to maintain and have expertise in. When they scale, they have their own scaling considerations. When you are dealing with SQLite, however, this is a, a massive benefit of not having to deal with this extra system. The cost of ownership goes down, the simplicity of the product and the uptime and operations uh, improves. And guess what? SQLite has all these extra performance benefits as well. A lot of it can be run in memory these days, uh, as well as just accessing that file on disk. Very quick, very fast, excellent performance. And based on the data volume of the application and the product's needs, you should more likely most use cases will benefit from SQLite directly. From a product and business perspective, saving on complexity and cost is significant. And this is why we're seeing a lot of enterprise based businesses that leverage SQLite behind the scenes and resell it will, you will get to gain this capability if you directly import SQLite libraries as an embedded database into your application. From a data availability and durability perspective, multi-instance replication is critical for that HA experience. Guess what? There are a lot of options available with SQLite directly leveraging something called LightFS. Oh, check this out. LightFS is oh, specifically tuned and targeted for a distributed SQLite. Oh, that's fantastic. Transparently replicate SQLite databases. That's pretty cool. Look at that. Run your application just like it's running against a local SQLite database on the disk. Behind the scenes, it's replicated to all the nodes in your cluster. And we can run our applications right next to our databases on the edge, which means that it can run anywhere and you will have exceptional performance and latency. Wow, this is very satisfying. I didn't realize that this was a thing. Check this out. All right, checking this out here, we see the replication position based on how LightFS does this distributed workload. We are able to replicate our database using this pattern. They use a combination of transaction ID and a checksum of the database contents. It looks like this, so we see the position and the checksum. They use this information when they're replicating chunks of the database over to other areas of your, of your infrastructure in your cluster. That's pretty fantastic. That allows you to streamline the replication and the ability to increase the read volume and read throughput basically linearly. If you have this data that's being copied across your clusters, you'll be able to easily have it accessible to any node that needs it immediately. This, can get, this is a really cool 
Like for example, this is going to be a phenomenal performance improvement and a dramatic improvement on high availability as well. This is this is fantastic. SQLite database size. I, check this out. This is a really interesting argument from Kent describes that the database size usually is something that comes up when you're talking about SQLite. For example, SQLite, oh, it's probably good for like small data sets, you know, maybe a couple of gigabytes. However, check this out. Kent's talking about uh, exabytes. That's a lot, that's huge. Really, wait, SQLite can deal with exabytes? Most of the web developers don't need anywhere near that amount of volume. Even databases like MySQL and Postgres will generally, while they're capable of handling these things, you have to come up with an infrastructure that can deal with them in such those volumes. And guess what? With SQLite, it seems to be able to handle this as well. Oh, this is great to see putting large amounts of data into SQLite database can be very efficient. This is interesting. It can be even faster retrieving data out of SQLite compared to the other kinds of systems. Oh, even from the file system directly. Oh, really? It says 35% faster than the file system directly. That is impressive. So the big win here is when it talks about the read write latency is competitive when compared to individual files on disk as you're accessing different data points you're using this in-memory lookup table of indexes, which can be a lot faster compared to directly accessing files on disk in a like Linux and type environment. Aha, <laughs> check it out. Okay, so this is how they're running the test. They're taking the data from the database and then they're, they're running this particular set of uh, requests and the size of the requests and the variance of the requests and the volume of the sizes. And guess what? Comparing that versus reading, you know, 100,000 files, you're gonna get a dramatically more performance out of uh, SQLite. This is exciting, I really like this. This tells you that SQLite has been optimized over the years, it's a very highly utilized database. And to be able to rely on something like this and embed into your application with its performance capabilities, this means you can build applications very fast, very powerful with large amounts of volumes of data and it'll provide a phenomenal user experience. Comparing this to more expensive systems such as Postgres and MySQL, uh, this is kind of an exciting new venture. If you haven't tried SQLite, you should give it a shot. It's really easy. You just import the client library and you point it at a file on disk, you can even have it in memory only, which will be even faster for those specific use cases that are maybe session oriented, that only need short term memory. Another little minor bonus with using SQLite directly is that you have the ability to leverage it directly in your application. You won't have to run a separate container for Postgres and MySQL. Ah, uh, no, it's actually pretty straightforward in general to run those on your system anyway. With SQLite, it's just not an issue, right? You don't have to even worry about it. It's just a file and this allows you to test things more quickly and easily. Ooh, and you can also run multiple instances in the same app at once with no trouble whatsoever. That is another really cool use case. I like that one. So developing and testing with SQLite is pretty powerful and streamlines your experience overall. Another thing, even though it's kind of minor, describes here having to set up a complicated uh, connection, right? So we're connecting to the database using connection parameters, using a host name or an IP address, things like that. And guess what? It's even though those things are kind of simple, we don't, we don't have to worry about it with SQLite. It's just inherent in the system and we don't need to worry about these extra credentials and things like that or these host names or dependencies. It's just, uh, it's just a file on disk. So this makes your experience fairly streamlined and straightforward. Also, you'll be able to save that data if you have like say a test data set, you could keep that in a, in a local file, maybe even as a small file, so it could maybe be included in your GitHub repository to have just some test data that lives there. And then you can mount that data in a volume directory using Docker, so that way it has access to that test data. You don't even have to copy it into the Docker container itself. SQLite is not without its weaknesses. There are a few things and few areas where SQLite SQLite just will have some shortcomings. Even though we've very much been talking about all the great capabilities of SQLite and how it's leveraged in enterprise applications, it feels fair that we would talk about the weaknesses. 
One of the neat patterns that you can have with Postgres or even MySQL is that you can subscribe to a change log, so subscriptions of data. This allows you to hook into the database and use it sort of as uh, um, an event emitter. So that way as data is written and collected on that data volume in the database and it's been indexed, you can use that to copy data and those events over to other systems that can leverage them. Maybe it hits a Kafka topic or it might hit, you know, a a routed in queue, message broker. So you can take that data that's been written into your database and then do extra work on it. SQLite doesn't have anything like that. However, you, I mean, <laughs> you can just, you, whenever something's written to your application code could just pop that over to a, a message broker of your own desire. Another downside of SQLite directly with a file on disk means that you can't use workbenches with the SQL code. For example, you wouldn't be able to MySQL workbench or any sort of SQL UI GUI system or maybe like a front end uh, web system that like uh, Mode Analytics or Snowflake. These things won't be able to connect into this database. And, and so under those conditions, this could be a shortcoming here for SQLite. Some of the common patterns that you would need to implement with this is to create Parquet files, upload those to an S3 bucket, and then allow something like a Snowflake or another engine to be able to parse that data and then create a, a connected data source. That's an extra step. And those kinds of things are necessary when you are doing analytics or user, user-based behavior data sort of meshing. I'd have to definitely say that is a shortcoming and it does require extra effort to bring that data from the SQLite database into your overall data, data environment. So that's a, that's a general challenge. I see here there's also no support for plugins. Something that's a lot popular these days are vector databases and one of the popular plugins for Postgres directly is a vector index. What you can do is you can take embeddings from your data pipeline, which could include user information, user chat messages, things like that, which can be uh, vectorized and then embedded into multidimensional space. You can take those vectors and put them into a database, which is an array of floating point values. And then you can run an index against those that will be available and query quickly. So you can do things like cosine similarity and other kinds of proximity data similarities that gives you relevancy searches in the database. Very popular thing these days is that vector database indexing scheme. It's not possible here in SQLite, though I bet we could probably fashion something that would give you a, a good proximity to that. It's not for free though, and you don't get it automatically with SQLite. And then Kent here also describes to us that SQLite doesn't support enumerations, which means that you're forced to use strings. So when it comes to identifying the value type of your columns, you're not gonna be able to know what you're really intending it to be. Maybe you'll have to come up with a convention, like, uh, like call it a number X, Y, Z, or a string uh, one, two, three, <laughs> Type, type, right? You have to label your columns, would have to label the kind of data that's embedded in that data row. And it looks like if you really, really like enumerations and you want to make sure to have that kind of typing available to you, there is a possibility here with some system. Let's see what we have. Uh, take a look here really quick. Yeah, I'm not sure this is something that uh, I'm, che I'm checking this out here. I would say uh, there's extra effort when it comes to enums in SQLite uh, and then having to include this extra bit here might be an additional challenge that I would just say, it's easier to keep things simple and just stick with uh, regular data column types. Should you use SQLite for your database of choice? The answer is probably yes, you should use it under those many scenarios, almost every situation, you're better off using SQLite because of all these advanced technology capabilities that we've been describing. It's performance, it's accessibility, and it's ability to be distributed across multiple systems. Even though we have the standard tried and true MySQL and Postgres, these systems require additional efforts and expertise that you will need in order to scale it and maintain those systems. With SQLite, you're gonna have an experience that is just overall simplified and you'll have improved performance as well. Now, if you're prior primary use case is going to be OLAP and business data and you need to pull analytics and derive insights from that data, you are probably better overall sticking with a system that can be integrated into existing data analyzing systems like Pentaho and Tableau. Maybe you have Snowflake, maybe you're running Athena on Amazon. There's so many different systems that would directly connect into those Postgres and MySQL systems that are a lot more streamlined, for example. And if that's your primary use case, you should probably stick with those 
existing systems. For all the other cases, SQLite seems like a pretty good option. Definitely give it a try. And I would have to say here, let's just scroll up really quick. One of my favorite advantages that I was not aware of before uh, talking about it here is that the SQLite is capable of handling exabytes volumes of data. That's, wait, one million terabytes? <laughs> That's so... That's a lot of data. Uh, it, this is something that I hadn't really considered before in its capabilities, but it is apparently a really good database that is not only the most widely used database in the world, but it also can handle scales that uh, I was unaware of previously, and it looks like a very satisfying database to use.